Great. So again, thank you for coming. Welcome everyone to our first lunch and learn of the year regarding our fact book. So today we're going to talk about the 2021 fact book findings, and then we're going to talk about what we're doing with small business lending data. And we will discuss or we'll demo, share a little sneak peek on some advances that we have with our data portal. And we will officially launch a research series that we um, posted online on Friday. So we will get a little presentation on that. I am Amber Henley, the Director of Research for Woodstock Institute. Uh, behind the scenes, we have Gordon Mayer, who I want to thank for helping arrange all of this, getting us going with Zoom. He's our marketing and communications consultant. Thank you very much. He's labeled as Horacio, but that is our Gordon. And then our research associate, Natalie Chang, who's going to take it from here. But I always have to acknowledge Spencer Cowan, who was my director of research <laughs> when I came on as the research associate. He is here. We're happy to have him here. So Natalie, oh, and I just want to um, ask if you can use the chat with any qu for questions that you have, we may or may not get to questions today, but at the end we will display our email addresses. Um, and so if you want to have, if you have a question, please email us directly. Use the chat. We do get a transcript of that so we can respond to your questions offline. And while one of us is talking, the other one will not be. If we can respond to your questions in the chat very quickly and easily, we will do that. Otherwise, we'll follow up via email if we don't have the time at the end of this presentation for your questions. So please write your questions down. Feel free to use the chat. Send that email while we are talking um, and we will get started. Natalie. Thank you, Amber. Yeah, go ahead to the next slide. So that's that's an overview of what Amber shared of what we'll be doing today. Go ahead. Amber, go ahead. Okay, so we'll kick it off with an overview of what we found when we looked at mortgage lending trends for 2021. Go ahead. So in past years, Woodstock always analyzes the data and we look at similar metrics. Um, and we always find the same disparities in these metrics. We find that Black and Latino households qualify for smaller dollar mortgages have lower property values, lower origination rates, and higher denial rates than whites. And if you're interested in those specific numbers, you can contact us and we can get you that information. It's important to name those disparities and continue to work to address them. But at the same time, sometimes telling the same story can sugarcoat or make our eyes glaze over in a way that's counterproductive to what we're actually trying to do. So. This year, we chose to focus our analysis on different areas where disparities are obvious. And those areas are where loans were made, the CRA regulated market versus the non-CRA regulated market, and the type of loans made, so conventional or not, or FHA loans. When we looked at these trends, first trends in where loans were made, what jumped out first was that lending among banks and institutions regulated by the CRA decreased. So that's the regulated market. In Chicago, lending activity dropped 8%, but more than an actual decline in lending, this is really just a return to normal because lending activity in 2020 was abnormally high as many existing homeowners, homeowners took advantage of low interest rates and refinanced their homes. What's more notable in 2021 was a marked increase in lending among institutions not regulated by the CRA. So for the sake of this conversation, I'll refer to these lenders as unregulated lenders. And in Chicago, unreg unregulated lending activity increased 13%. Next slide. So this is significant because the unregulated market serves more lower income Black and Latino groups than whites. And for one, that's because the federal CRA does not cover online lenders, and so many unregulated lenders are online. And with recent trends in physical bank closures, especially in lower income communities and communities of color, getting a mortgage online is much easier than going to a physical bank, especially if that physical bank doesn't exist in your neighborhood. Loans from unregulated lenders also tend to have lower financial requirements, such as lower credit score, 
And so for lower income borrowers in general and for borrowers of color who tend to have lower incomes, mortgages from unregulated lenders are more accessible than mortgages from traditional banks and regulated lenders. So we're gonna dive deeper into the data to explore these demographic trends. But before I do that, I want to note our intentional focus here on just Black, Latino, and LMI groups, low, low to moderate income. In this analysis, we do not include those that identify as Asian or other, and we also don't include those who do not report, report a race at all in the mortgage data. And this is because there are unique and crucial differences within Asians and other racial groups, and including these populations in this analysis would misrepresent those trends. Um, and those that analysis deserves its own separate focus to study. So in 2021, Blacks, Latinos, and low to moderate income populations took out more loans from the unregulated market compared to whites. In Chicago, 69% of the loans Black borrowers received came from unregulated lenders, which was 10% higher than the rate for whites. At the same time, majority of those added borrowers in that increase in unregulated lending were borrowers from lower income groups, Black groups, and Latino groups. Of the increase, one third were Black, and just 2% were white, one third were Latino, and two third were lower income. In the whole Chicago region, the number of white borrowers actually dropped overall. And so that means that borrowers that don't identify, identify as white accounted for even more of that increase in unregulated lending. Loans in the unregulated market also come with higher costs. In 2021, 44% of loans in the unregulated market carried costs greater than $5,000 compared to just under a third of loans in the regulated market. And those high cost loans are also becoming more common, especially in the unregulated market. So in Chicago, loans with high costs grew about 9%, which is more than double the rate in the regulated market. Loans in the unregulated market are also more likely to be FHA loans. So they're insured by the Federal Housing Administration which are also more likely to be higher costs. In Chicago, 13% of unregulated loans were FHA compared to just 3% of regulated. And though FHA loans subsidize lower income borrowers um, and are meant to increase home ownership among these groups, they are more costly than conventional loans. That's because they require mortgage insurance payments for the life of the loan. And they also carry other fees associated with lower financial status of an FHA borrower. In Chicago's unregulated market, 77% of FHA loans carry costs greater than $5,000 compared to 34%, um, less than half that rate in the regulated market. or sorry, 77% of FHA loans carry costs greater than $5,000 in the unregulated market compared to 34% of conventional loans in the unregulated market. So we already know FHA loans are more common among lower income groups because the very purpose of them is to serve lower income borrowers wanting to become homeowners. Um, but the last piece of the picture on FHA loans is that they're more common among Black and Latino populations as compared to whites. In 2021, 31% of all loans to Black borrowers in Chicago were FHA loans, compared to just 6% of all loans to white borrowers. We know that unequal incomes and wealth by race and ethnicity, particularly between Blacks and whites, certainly have something to do with those differences. Blacks generally have lower incomes than whites, and so it would follow that more Blacks would take out FHA loans compared to whites. But even when we equalize or create a proxy for equalizing income and wealth, Blacks still received more FHA loans compared to their white counterparts. That rate was seven times higher than whites. 14% of Black applicants in this analysis received FHA loans compared to just 2% of white applicants. Now, next slide. So that's a lot of information, that's a lot of data, that's a lot of statistics. Why does all this matter? 
For one, it matters because we're always paying attention to how lending patterns are evolving among groups that have a history of mistreatment in the financial space, specifically lower income and Black, Latino, and non-white groups. Because most Black, Latinos, and lower income borrowers take out loans from non-CRA regulated lenders, it's important that we pay close attention to what's going on in that market. When we look at loans made in that market, we see loans with greater costs made to borrowers from these groups. This also matters because of who the lenders in the unregulated market are. We know that many of these lenders are online and they don't have a physical presence in the communities they serve, which means they're less likely and able to serve communities in other ways. Um, the federal CR Federal CRA also does not cover mortgage companies, so many of these lenders don't offer products that help build long-term long -term wealth and financial well-being, such as savings accounts or uh, loans for small businesses. So in sum, in 2021, lending grew in ways that directly affected lower income groups, Blacks and Latinos the most. And this increase included many high cost loans from lenders that have little to no incentive or ability to invest in the long term wealth of individuals and neighborhoods. If you're interested in learning more, we are working on putting up a blog post that summarizes all these trends. And as we mentioned at the top of the presentation, you can also reach out if you're interested in more of the nitty gritty details of that research. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to pivot a little now from our discussion of mortgage lending to a discussion of business lending. So every year, along with the mortgage lending uh, research we publish, we also publish a set of data on trends in small business lending. And this year, we're really wanting to build out this report to be more useful and robust. And so in this part of the presentation, we'll let you know the data that we have right now and ask what you would like to see as you think about businesses and business lending in your community. We ask that you write your ideas in the chat as you think of them or your questions or your thoughts, or you put your email in the chat if you have ideas and would like to be contacted um, to have a conversation with us. We really want this to be a conversation with you, uh, how we build this out, and we want to use your ideas as we work on what this piece looks like. Next slide. So here's a list of the data we have right now. And again, what we're asking is just to tell us what you think would be most helpful to see either with these pieces of information or if there's something missing here that you think would tie things together or summarize, summarize well, um, or provide additional information for what you see going on with businesses in your community. So these are businesses, um, business loans by loan size. We have different amounts number of loans to small businesses, vacancies, how long those vacancies have been going on, and number of businesses added each year. And there's different breakdowns for these. So um, we will be making the slides available to at the end along with the recording. So you'll be able to reference these items as well later. Next slide. So the other piece of this is we're not thinking just about what data we want to report, but how we want to report it. It's the visualization piece. We have location information for all of these, um, all this data on loans for businesses. So we can report lending by geography and add other pieces of information that go along with where a loan is made. So for example, the income and the racial demographic of that area. So the question here is what would be an effective way to visualize that or what other pieces of information like income, like race, mapped onto business data would be interesting for you to see or, or provide um, helpful um, reference points for you. Again, please write ideas or put your email in the chat if you'd like to talk to us about this. Um, we will make these slides available at the end so you'll be able to reference them later and we look forward and are eager to hear from you. Amber? Thank you, Natalie. So now we will move on to demoing our data portal. So I will stop my share. And before we go into that, 
we'll just revisit our current data portal. So if you, let's go to the screen. If you go to Woodstock's website now, uh, woodstockinst.org, you just want to select data portal. It's right up top. We make it easy for you. Um, this is what we have for the past year. This is what you've seen when you've gone to the data portal. This is what you will see when you go to the data portal right now. So I wanted to make sure you knew how, where to access this. This is what um, currently exists. And I want to share with you what we're working on. We've been meeting individually with organizations and demoing our data portal, gathering feedback, and just taking all the notes. How can we improve this? How do we make this more accessible? How do we make it clear? What do people want to see and know? And how do they want to interact with the data? And so we have begun the process of incorporating that feedback. So I won't, um, it'll be a, probably at least a month before we transition to this portal that I'm going to um, demo to you now. So what I'm going to do is put a link in the chat for anyone who is interested in dealing with this data portal in real time. Um, Natalie did a fantastic job about six months ago showing how you can, um, how to navigate this data portal. So I'm going to put this link in the chat for that YouTube video if you want to navigate the current data portal. And now for the big review. Okay, so pretty soon we will be launching this new interactive data portal. Right now, what I will share with you is what we have been able to do with the feedback that we have gathered as it relates to the community area, uh, area comparison. Very excited about this. Getting everything on one page is one of the goals. To be able to focus on outcomes of one community area is the feedback that we uh, we. Uh, we took from many institutions, a mapping feature to be, un be able to locate where a community area is and position it. And the other thing that we heard over and over again is the ability to compare. So this is the first iteration, the incorporating that feedback, taking what we currently have and trying to meet the needs of community. So what we can do here is select on the map community area. And this demo you'll notice is just the Chicago area. So we will build out the seven collar counties as well. Like we uh, represent the data currently on the, the data portal. This iteration is just in its infancy and we're focused on getting everything right for the 77 community areas of Chicago. So right now we are going to look at the information for North, North Park. I selected North Park and an interesting feature here is people wanna see comparison values. So we have these charts that give you the ratios, but we also, if you're, you want to dig in, we now have the ability to just focus in on the numbers. So if you just want to see like, what does that look like? What does that distribution look like? But what are those actual numbers? We have added this, this feature to go back and forth very easily. You'll notice that we're still building out the rest of the uh, ca categories. Um, so this is our home ownership rate. There's a lot of information on this tab, and you may not always care about home ownership or the number of branches. You may want to focus on a few things. So we've also incorporated the feature of hiding certain charts so you can focus on exactly what you want to focus on. So if you only care about these things in the moment, you hide the other charts and you can focus here. We also want to make it printable. So now you can PDF this, send it if you want in an email, or you can print this and have your own page of the fact book that matters to you. So that's just one little piece. The other part that I'm very, very excited about is a comparison feature. So if you select control and pick another community area, and I'm going to go with West, well, I'm going to go with Inglewood. If you select Inglewood and you want to know how does this community area compare to North Park, you now can compare side by side what these values are. So again, we have this bar chart, but if I want to know what those actual numbers are, I can go to the table. I can go to the table. So now I can make one for one comparisons. Well, what are the income distributions? Because I need to understand that. 
what's similar and what's different? What are the outcomes there? So that is the other feature that I wanted to demo. And as Natalie mentioned, we are going to be building out the data, the small business data portal. It's going to be a separate entity. And we've begun that here as well. And we're just going to wait for the feedback. We want to speak with you and see what the needs are. What information do you care most about? How should we be displaying it? How should we be cleaning the data to make it more usable for you? And the last thing here. What we wanted to make sure is that we were always able to situate how a community area, or if we're, again, once we get to the larger um, Calder counties, how does Kane compare to the city of Chicago? Because the city of Chicago is such a major player in this region. If you'll notice, there's this bar right here on all of the charts. This always represents what is the average for the city as a whole. So right here, the average uh, income between 100 and $150,000, it looks like North Park is in alignment with the city average. Inglewood would be below it. So this allows you to compare. It's always going to compare. So say I only want to know what's going on with one community area. And right here, I've uh, selected Jefferson Park. I'm always going to have an understanding how does this community area compare to the city of Chicago? So we've incorporated that in our fact book, in our 2021 fact book, we added the Chicago area, the Chicago at large comparison to every one of our charts. We're also going to be incorporating that feature here in our data portal. And that concludes our demo. Um, so again, we appreciate any feedback, any notes, reach out to me directly. If you have any additional notes, something else that's coming up here is our plan is to be able to also go between years. So you can compare community areas, but eventually we're gonna to get to the point where we wanna look for one community area. What is that trend over time? So understand that we are going in that direction um, and we are taking any more feedback that you have to make this more accessible, uh, more relevant to the needs of community members but also housing counseling agencies, if we have any of those on the call, how can we make this tool more handy for you when you're advising future home buyers? So that concludes our demo portal. And I'm very excited about what we have been able to do so far. And I hope you are too, because it's, it's, a, it's a step in another direction from what we have been demoing. And I just want to note that all of our values, we are working it out. So the values that you saw there, they may not be accurate. We are demo, like we are testing and all of these things. We're working out the kinks, but that is what we will be doing. When we finally launch it, the distributions will be accurate. We're going to have all of our racial categories and everything will be great. But just know that we are working. Those of you that we've collected feedback from, we are incorporating it. We are actively working to get that done. Okay. I'm going to share again. So Natalie or um, Gordon, let me know if I'm sharing the right screen. I'm looking on the chat. Looks good. Yeah, you're good. Looks good. Thank you. OK, so now we are going to move from our data portal demo to reframing the racial wealth, racial wealth gap series. So at the end of this, I'm going to add the link to the chat so you can read the full article. Um, but I want you to pay attention to me, so I'm not going to do that yet. So uh, reframing the racial wealth gap series is a solutions focused series designed to help close the racial wealth gap by reframing homeownership's role in closing the black white wealth gap. And the reason why we took this on is because we understand that the stories that we tell matter and the why behind the work drives the programs and the policies we make. And so if we're telling a story that is that is skewed, then the solutions that we create will, will also be skewed. Now we are going to be talking about home ownership, which is a very similar sensitive subject. So on the front end, we want to fully acknowledge that Woodstock, myself, our research team, we respect and appreciate the relationship between home ownership, dignity, and the American dream. And we need to emphasize on the beginning stages of this, that this series is not, is not intended to discourage efforts to increase homeownership. 
Rather, our hope is to demonstrate the counterproductive narrative that elevates homeownership as the answer to closing the racial wealth gap. We want to appropriately situate homeownership and then also call out what needs to be called out to make it equally wealth building. So on that note, I think it's important to begin just naming what is the racial wealth gap? What is, what is the homeownership gap? And so these numbers are going to vary from institution to institution, but they're always going to be around the same numbers. So according to the Federal Reserve, um, for every dollar of white wealth, a black household has 25 cents of that. In other way, in other words, a white household holds four times as much wealth as a black household. And then we understand that there is a gap. So about 45% of black households um, own their home versus 75% of white households, okay? So these are the common narratives. These are the values that are attached to them and they both matter and they're both important. And what we are working on is directly related to addressing the wealth gap. So what is the reframe? How are we reframing the reframe as we say in our article? The two points that we are gonna make throughout this series, and we make a little bit in the first article, is that home ownership needs a strategic overhaul, given that as it exists, it is unequitable and perpetuates a racial wealth gap. And we'll show that in a moment. And the second thing that we wanna do is, even though home ownership is important and it should be a part of the conversation of closing the wealth gap, we have to rationalize its position in this, this, this strategy of closing the wealth gap to account for and to allow to have as large a platform other assets and investments like small business, which is getting more attention, which we think is great, but we want it to have more. We want it to have just as much as home ownership has had. But simple things that all households can access right now that actually build wealth in a different way that is not as controversial. A retirement accounts, estate planning, money market accounts. We want to also lift that up more than it's been lifted up in the general narrative. We give credit and we will lift up institutions that have already been doing this work and we want to give them a higher platform to increase the investment in the work that they're doing to meet kind of what the home ownership narrative has gotten in terms of, of support. Thank you for the question. These are national figures. In the first slide, those were national figures. Very good question. Okay, so we talk about what our reframe is. Now let's talk about like why this particular reframe. And the first is because homeownership should afford families equitable wealth <laughs> and account for like the documented government sponsored systemic disadvantage. So what we're going to point out is that the system as it exists does not adequately account for those things, but we're calling this out to say it should. So how do we become part of the solution to actually make it do what it's supposed to do? Because you cannot remove home ownership from wealth building and American capitalism. You cannot do it. That is, how, this, that is the way that we do things. But we have to make sure that it is equitably wealth building. So we want to call this out. We want to call out the system to then be able to help do whatever we can to reform it in a way. The second thing is it is just unwise. If you ask any investor, it is just unwise to put all of one's available capital in a single investment, in a single asset class with high entry and exit costs. So we should never be just talking about home ownership, home ownership, home ownership. We should talk about home ownership and then some. So to Natalie's point about um, the unregulated markets, where you are creating homeowners, but you don't give access as well to the other things that go along with that, right? Um, like the money market accounts or the things that you would get in a regulated bank. We want to have access for all communities to both of those things simultaneously. Ooh, I got ahead of myself. So we are gonna get right into discussing what we saw. And we're gonna do this in two ways. The first way we're gonna start with the reality of 
income inequality, racial income inequality. So in the next slide, you're going to see what the income distributions for what we identify as the middle income for both black applicants and white applicants in 2021. So we use the HMDA data, the same data that we use to, uh, to do the fact book and to update our data portal. We use that same data to look at black and white non-Hispanic applicants in 2021. And we identified what were all the applicants from least to greatest, and we identify, well, what was that range for the middle 60% of both Black and both white applicants? And what we saw that for Black applicants, that range was 50K to 120K, okay? Um, and then we saw that for white applicants, it was between 79K and 235. What is very interesting is that the median income for the Black household the Black household, our applicant in 2021 was $78,000, but the bottom of the middle income range for white applicants was just above that at $79,000. So essentially that means that the median Black applicant made less than 80% of white applicants, um, which is a sobering um, reality and truth because we lift it up will lift up throughout our series, Income Inequality. And one of the interesting things, anybody who's followed my work on um, the plunder of Black wealth through contract buying, whenever I speak about that extraction, the 84% markup on housing, I always situate it. And okay, a Black household paid 84% more for their house in during the second great migration, which ended in 1970, right? Fif over 50 years ago. But then I always say 80% more, but you do realize that in, in that point in time, a Black household made 50% less. So they're paying 80% more, making 50% less. The part that gets me every time is when I revisit, well, what is that income differential now? It's basically the same. It's almost 50 cents to the dollar today. And there have been studies that have shown how this particular metric has not really evolved over time. It's been consistent. This type of income inequality has existed and it still has to be named. And we have to look at that because again, if the middle 60% falls in this income range, we have to pay attention to that because that's our market. That is our middle 60%. How are we serving them in the same ways that we're serving the middle 60% of white? They both matter. They both matter equally. So are we making sure that they have similar outcomes, equitable outcomes? So the next piece of this is looking at debt, because if we're talking about being approved for a mortgage, we have to talk about income and we have to talk about debt. So as you see here, the average rate of households with a DTI above 43%, which we use as the industry, uh, industry strand, standard of being a bit risky, something above 43% of all black households, 32% had DTIs above 43% versus only 15% for white households, which makes sense for a couple of reasons. Lower income, you still have the same needs. So your bills are still generally the same, right? So lower income with the same needs, you're going to have a higher debt to income ratio. But then we also have to account for what research shows us is that Black households generally maintain higher debt loads as a result of carrying more medical debts, higher student loan balances, and credit lines with less favorable terms and higher minimum payments. So the same type of credit cards, but with higher minimum payments because they have less favorable returns and interest rates, uh, which would leave less disposable income. In this presentation, we haven't shared this chart, but it is included on the, um, the article that I'll share with you at the end of this presentation. But it's just also to note that Black households with less income acquire costlier mortgages at the onset. And I think Natalie also lifted that up very well early on. So, it makes sense, may not be fair, but it makes sense that given lower incomes, higher DTIs and greater debt loads, uh, black mortgage pre-approval amounts are gonna be lower than their white counterparts, right? And when we say counterparts in this context, we mean quintile to quintile, that middle 20% versus that middle 20%. So because mortgage pre-approval amounts directly correlate to buying power and property values, 
It just means that property values are also going to be lower for Black households compared to white households. And this shows you just that. But property values are how you build wealth, right? And the appreciation values. So what we did here, we found that for the past 20 years, uh, the average, so including the recession, the highs and the lows, the COVID boom, all of that, we incorporated all of that to level it out, smooth it out over the past 20 years. The average U.S. home appreciates at about 5% every year, okay? So that's the average home. We know and understand that Black homes appreciate at lower rates on average. This is all researched and documented and cited well in our article. Um, but we picked the same number just to prove a point. We use that same 5%. That means that if the average is 5%, that means that white homeowners, their homes on average appreciate for higher than 50%, black homeowners on average lower than 5%, I don't have to say 50%, but 5%, right? We understand that reality. But just for the sake of, again, driving a point home, we kept this percentage, this appreciation rate constant. And we found that the median black wealth gained would be about $949,000 while a white household would gain $1.7 million in wealth, which is about half. A black family gains about half, 50%, 56% to be exact. So we also make note of the fact that most homeowners aren't gonna stay for the 30 years. We, we did this calculation over 30 years because a mortgage is 30 years. But we understand that people don't stay in their homes on average for 30 years. So we also did this calculation based on the median duration of time for the American home ownership, which is about 13 years. It has increased over the past three years. Um, that wealth gap is still $182,000. So there is going to be a wealth gap if for home ownership, right? But that's again looking at this income differential, which we understand that if the income is lower, debt to higher is lower, we expect to see those things. It may not be fair because we understand of systemic reasons why this is so, and we can we will get into that through the life of the of this series. But let's just look at another scenario just to see if things are the same. And let's ask this question, how does the current home ownership system build wealth for white and black households when income is removed from the equation and the only main difference is race, okay? So in this part of the analysis, we focus on systemic differences in the home ownership system itself. So not just, we're just gonna ignore income inequality for a moment, although you can't do that because that is embedded in the system. But just for the sake of this analysis, let us do that for a moment and just focus again on systemic differences in the home ownership system itself. We're gonna now just focus on the income range set by the middle 60% of black households, the, the, the middle income group that we identified at that 50 to $120,000 a year, okay? So what you're gonna see now is just again, white and black applicants who made between 50 and $120,000 a year. The other thing that we wanted to add is, we wanted to say, okay, well, what if these applicants had the same income and they also were what maybe the industry would call the best applicants because they had debt to income ratios at or below 43%, which is an industry standard for being good, acceptable. Or LTVs, loan to values, at or below 80%, meaning this household was able to come to the table with at least 20%, right? So that makes you more comfortable. They seem less risky. Like this is, this is who you want. So let's see what happens when we do that, when we level the playing field amongst black and white applicants in 2021. And unfortunately, um, <laughs> the current system doesn't account in the right way. So let's take a look at what happens then. So the property values were still lower, which I think we may expect. Um, but we should also note that Black applicants were denied four times as often as white applicants in this dream scenario. Uh, Black households also paid more for their loans. Um, in the first simulation, they did as well in this one. And 
it just seems like regardless of financial status, Black applicants are, able, are less able to access homeownership and receive costlier loans when they do. Okay, so now they have the same profiles and a Black household is charged for their loan 3K versus 2.5 or 2,500, right? For, um, for a white applicant. And now we look at property values. And in the first slide, I didn't actually call out what these numbers were for the property values, but the median Black property value was $255,000 for the first chart that I showed you with property values, where we just took, which would make sense because we leveled at those levels. But the income, the, the white income is $485,000 at this same level. Okay, so there's this gap already with the property value, and you know where we're going with this. So even in this space where we leveled everything with incomes and debt levels the same to be qualified for a higher property value, that also signals that the white, white household must have had some wealth or something because, again, the incomes are the same, the debt levels are the same, and you're approved for a higher value. When we're talking about wealth, we also have to talk about what we come to the table with. So that just signals something else. We won't get into that now, but we will in future articles or product that comes throughout this series. So it's important to note this. Okay, so it gets a bit more interesting. So I've just, I've already shown this to you and I'll let you look at that. Um, black homeowners still only gained about half the wealth, the same situation, right? When we look at the different incomes, which you would totally expect in this, in this scenario, where you would think things should be more level because we're at the same income levels, we're at the same risk profile, we have the best candidates for both groups. The, the sobering fact is that Black homeowners gained 53% of the wealth. And if you remember before, in that quintile to quintile exchange, they made 56%. Black households gained 56% of white wealth at that level. This is less wealth, which signals, it seems as if there's a wealth penalty for Black households that are more financially sound. Because in this instance, the same amount of wealth that was gained in this first iteration, having a better risk profile, you gain the same amount of wealth. And that is really an uncomfortable statement to make, but that is what the numbers showed us, is that when we just accounted for these DTIs above 43% and all the other LTVs, the wealth built was 949K. In this best scenario, meaning applicants who worked on their credit, who got their debt down, they had the same wealth potential, creation potential, as if they did none of those things. Now, white wealth increased by $149,000. So there was a benefit to having all of your ducks in a row for a white household, but there was not for a black household. Um, so again, after 13 years, so again, we say, we understand that you may not stay in your home for 30 years. If you just do the average 13 years, there was still a wealth gap of $221,000 between a black household and a white household with this same lower risk profile and income levels. Now, Black homeowners start with lower financial status and initial home values than white homeowners. We know this, we've shown this, and sometimes we just kind of accept it like that's just the way that it is, ignoring systemic reasons why this is the case. Applying the same appreciation rate yields less gain for Black homeowners over time. The only way owning a home will close the racial wealth gap is if Black homeowners enjoy a higher appreciation rate than white homeowners, which is just like the simple math that we point out. Lower value, same rate, even though we know that it's at appreciating at a lower rate, the numbers just won't add up. And the point of us starting this series is that together, organizations on the call, community members, uh, we want to think together more critically about closing the racial wealth gap and how homeownership should play, what role home ownership should play in it and how we help it, how we support the system, reform the system to make it equally or equitably wealth building because it should be. It's not okay that it doesn't. 
So we point this out not to just say, hey, just so you know, we point this out to say, but it should be. So what can we do? What can we do together to make sure that it eventually is? Throughout this series, um, so this is just the beginning. This first article is basically, I've summarized it for you, but I would still like for you to read it in, in its entirety because um, we make some really cool points. Throughout this series, we will point out several challenges, each time sharing potential remedies. This first article is just to, to level set and just to debunk this the, the, the common narrative so that we can begin the remedies and the solutions part. These remedies will be co-created with community, just flowing from the network of those involved in and negatively impacted by wealth inequity, which is literally everyone on this call, everyone who reads this article, everyone who does not read this article, that is all of us, we are a part of the system. Our approach will mirror the broadness of this issue, ranging from capitalists, socialists, and everything in between. Uh, we aim to uplift perspectives that resonate in new, uh, unique ways, new and old, with everyone. And our goal is not to make ourselves comfortable, you all comfortable all the time, but rather to encourage us to sit uncomfortably with these perspectives that we're gonna lift up because we want to lift up all the perspectives that play a role in this and just to be a part, a conduit. Um, and it's in this discomfort and unfamiliarity that we know, all of us know, change occurs. So you'll notice when you read the article that we flag things that need deeper understanding or exploration as it relates to closing the wealth gap that may directly relate to home ownership, or it may relate to lifting up these other investments and assets that we have to start giving more attention to as an industry. Um, and so I'm not gonna read all of these out. These are all listed at the end of the article, but those of you on the call, I put this up here and again, ask you to read this article in its entirety to, to figure out how we work together. And if you can connect with us to talk about ways that you wanna be a part of any one of these categories because something's gonna come up. It's gonna be an article. It may be more than just an article. We have not defined what comes next. Um, we have not fully defined what comes next because it's not for us to define. We wanna work with you. We wanna work with community. It's for all of us to define. We just started to build out what we've seen as the common hangups within the system. So this is a living, breathing series um, and we're open to critiques and guidance and again collaboration that's what we want to do and that is the purpose of us using this time to kind of demo and walk through and to again let you know we are not coming for home ownership we love home ownership because we understand the power that it builds for community and for individuals and um, but we want it to be as equitably wealth building as it is for others because it should be um, so that being said, I want to in that there, and again, I've opened it up, please email me directly, use the chat, we can respond um, there, but I want to invite you to our 50th anniversary celebration. I'm sure you have gotten in the mail, the save the date. I've gotten two of them and I work here. So I'm imagining you're on our mailing list. So you've gotten them as well. You may have gotten emails, newsletters, please. Please, please, please come. So I'm gonna put in the chat the link to the launching page for this series. So this is, okay, so that's, this is the link to the series where I just summarized. And then this is for you to register to come to our events. Let's see, I have something in our Q&A and I do have time. This way, I know you said the solution discussion will come later, but can you briefly mention some potential policy solutions that should change to address the problem of higher and increase the lending to borrowers? Thank you, Esther, with um, WBEZ. You have a question about potential policy solutions and suggested changes to address the problem of higher closing costs and increase the lending to borrowers of color in the regulate, unregulated market. So um, this question is a really good question. And this is a question that we want to work with lending institutions, dig into a little bit more, because we have some policy solutions that are related to one side, but we don't 
have the full fee structure. Those are things that are housed behind doors. And so we have to understand that collaboratively with the lending industry. So I'm going to note this, Esther, and as we build that out with the lending side, with the lenders, I would love to include you in that. And please take my email address from the chat and Natalie's, and please email us directly too. If you could email your question directly to us, that would be fantastic. Thank you, Esther. Well, and uh, as you know, Amber, and I feel like this happens at this part of these webinars quite often. Um, I'm not sure if Jane is still on the call, but it sounds very similar to some of the proposals and recommendations in the MAI report that Jane is working on. So, and I know that's forthcoming, so it may be too soon to, to talk about that. Thank you. So we will can definitely follow up on that. And I don't think she's on the call anymore, but I know we're still working through that, that paper. So thank you again, Esther. Email us directly. I'm excited to talk with you and anybody else who emails us based on what we have shared here. Cancel. Okay. And that does conclude our presentation. And we thank you for joining us. And I think I have, what else do we have in the chat? You are welcome. I hope to hear from you. I hope you do have questions and concerns. Yes, we really do want to have a conversation and communicate. About everything that we have talked about today, we talked about a lot. So hopefully you replay this video and sit with it. The lending trends, if you have questions about the lending trends that Natalie presented at the very beginning, if you have any questions about small business and you want to be a part of that process of helping us make that more accessible and make that more relevant. If you want to be a part of helping us continue to make the data portal more interactive, more relevant, more useful. Again, special shout out to my HCAs because I think this would be a very useful tool to help um, support community. And then again, if you would like to be a part of our reframing the racial wealth gap series, we already have partners identified. I see some of them on this call, so I'm grateful that you're here. Um, but we want to include everybody. We want to include banks. We want to include the city. We want to include community members, community leaders, community organizers, um, housing institutions. We want you all included in this process, and we want to do this together. So thank you. And uh, yes, yeah, so just lifting up again, we will be sharing links that we have shared here. Um, we're going to share this presentation and this recording will be posted and we'll share this recording as well. And I want to thank 